life is relationships. As, as a matter of fact, um, we went through this big project, um, building project, and I had a relationship from the first project we did with this contractor, um, and we really built a friendship. And I told him that there was a few things that were going sideways in my mind, and I called him, the owner of the company, and I said, listen, we have a relationship. Whatever I say, I want to keep in mind that we have a relationship. I don't want to sever, don't want to hurt, I don't want to strain the relationship. As a matter of fact, relationships mean so much to God that he sent his son, come on somebody, that we could be um, in right, what, relationship. The greatest commandment uh, is a, a commandment of relationship. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Relationship. There's nothing for me uh, more important than relationships. So then why are relationships so, <laughs> so difficult at times? How come they're so, so hard? Why? why do they hurt so much? And how can we have so many misunderstandings and misgivings about relationships? If you all would give me a few minutes, I'm going to walk through some of the uh, things that I think would help us in relationships. The title today is Facing the Fears That Ruin Relationships. Let me just take a quick sample. Um, how many of you all have ruined a relationship before? Amen, before, before. Amen. Um, and I would argue that there's nothing more difficult, nothing or not much more difficult than being stuck in a bad relationship. Now, let me not talk about just marriages. I'm talking about being stuck in a bad relationship uh, at work or being stuck in a bad relationship um, with siblings or with family members. It, there's nothing more painful um, than to have to deal with bad relationships. So I want to talk about fears and how we can face our fears, our fears that can help increase, help um, relationships. Y'all ready? Amen. And I want to use as a backdrop, I want to use as a backdrop, um, Genesis chapter 3, verses 6 through 19. Genesis 3, verses 6 through 19. And, and, and if you should have your notes as we go through this, I want you to follow me. I think we have some good stuff to get through. Let us pray. God of grace and glory, speak for your servants are listening. Use me, for I am available Glorify yourself, because that's what only you can do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, so the first thing I want you to write down in your notes is the fact that my fear of exposure makes me distant. <clears throat> my fear of exposure makes me distant. Amen. Um. One of the things that makes it very difficult for us to get close to each other, for us to interact with each other, is that there's a lot of us that stay distant because there's a lot in us that we don't like about ourselves. I ain't getting no help today. And, you know, I'm not going to put up with this too much longer. Um, I'll leave. I, I'll take my shorts and go north. <laughs> um, there's a lot that we don't like about ourselves, and, and if we want to admit it, um, uh, we don't want others to see it. And I know that that's a trip because think about it. When you meet someone for the first time, even if it's just as a friend, even if it's a colleague, even if it's an interview, even if it's relationally, we don't give everybody our garbage right up front. Right? As a matter of fact, we are taught to put our best foot forward, to put on, you know, uh, airs or put on, um, um, you know, a, a, a good face, if you will, so that people don't really see who you are, at least initially. And we keep people distant. And, and, and it's interesting because in Genesis chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, it says, God called to Adam. Y'all remember the story, um, um, Genesis uh, chapter 3, verses 3 through 19? It's when God placed Adam and Eve in the garden. It's when God had um, told them that they can have free access except for to one little area, and you know that they end up going in that area, doing what they were not supposed to do, and then it got real ugly from there. Amen? Amen. Amen. And it's interesting, before that, everything was all good. Everything was all good, but then they strayed. And when they made a mistake, when they 
when it got to the point where they knew they had blown it, there was something about them that they didn't want to be exposed. They um, began to hide. God called to Adam, why are you hiding? He said, why are you hiding? Let me, can I just pause for a moment? Whenever God asks a question, he already knows the answer. Right? Um, and so he says, why are you hiding? And Adam said, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Stop for a moment. It's interesting. He says, I was afraid, fear. And then he says, naked, and I hid. What's interesting, in Genesis chapter 2, Adam and Eve were both naked and felt no shame. But just one chapter later, they're hiding in their nakedness. Isn't it interesting that when we have nothing to hide, we don't mind being exposed. But when we have secret sins or secret ways or things that we, we hide, and it's interesting, we hide from the folks, or sometimes we hide from the folks who already know what's going on. God always knows the answer to the question he asks. He doesn't want, he, he doesn't want you to hide it. He wants you to admit it. He wants you to own up to it. And we use fear as a way to keep us um, um, from dealing with what we need to deal with. Fear. Um, with fear, God always wants us to face it and not to fake it. Amen. And to be naked means to be exposed. It means to be uncovered. It means to be vulnerable. It means to be out in the open. It means to be unprotected. And that scares us. Amen. Amen. And you know, it's interesting because one of our deepest fears of being seen for what we really are and for who we really are. You know, that's the, that's the beauty of relationships, really, is that you can be yourself around that person who really loves you. But oftentimes we try to hide. And let me tell you what fear does. Fear damages you on at least three different levels. The first level, fear brings about shame. Look at verse 7. They suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. Fear is often based in shame. When you carry shame, you are easily embarrassed. Come on, somebody. When you carry shame, it makes you self-conscious. It makes us nervous. It makes us fearful of being humiliated. And it makes us easily mortified. You guys have heard this thing. If you tell it, it's a testimony. If someone else tells it, it's gossip. Y'all heard that before? And, and, so, and so shame has no place in relationships. Amen. Second, the second um, problem with fear is that it's listed right here in 7, part B. Uh, so they sue fig leaves to cover themselves up. Write this down. Um, the second phase is the cover-up. We try to conceal our true selves. And it's interesting because today we have more people who are so sophisticated in the way they try to conceal themselves, the way they try to hide themselves. Some people, in their own insecurities and their own weaknesses, they use humor to keep people at distance. At distance. Uh, some people use this image of being all together. They they dress together. They drive a car that's together. Their words and their language is together. They, they're always on point, and they're doing that because they don't want people to see their weaknesses. They don't want people to see. I'm reminded of this, um, 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 the Wiz, not, not, the, not the Wizard of Oz, but the Wiz. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and Richard Pryor was the Wiz. And the whole point on the Wiz was to project this image of power and strength behind the scenes he was simply an insecure person and many of us are that way we want to produce power and strength to to cover up our own weaknesses and it's interesting because a fig leaf is small and you got to have a whole bunch of figs to cover you up come on somebody how many of y'all are covering stuff up how many fig leaves do you need to cover up your stuff amen amen um, and it's interesting because not only that, but, but when we cover ourselves up, um, uh, we, we, we try to use every means available. I, I remember I was counseling a couple, um, 
And, I mean, they had one of the most violent relationships I'd ever seen. And they had a violent episode one evening, and I got called in to, to kind of help monitor that. I mean, the children's services was in the place, and it was just an ugly situation. That was on like a, like a Thursday evening. Friday morning, the wife puts on a picture of her beautiful family and how much she loves her husband, and it just is kind of this white picket fist. And it's, it's interesting because we use social media to try to present something that's not real. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't put that thing on social media, but you, you didn't have to put anything. <laughs> amen. amen. You could have just left it blank. Amen, amen, amen. And then the last thing is not only, not only is it a problem because it brings shame, and not only does it uh, we cover up, but fear also makes us distant from God. Then they hid from God among the trees. God doesn't expect perfection but he does expect honesty. Amen? And it's interesting because if you look at it, um, come here, Mike. If you look at Genesis chapter 2, I want you guys to do, do this comparison, Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2, when God and Adam were interacting, he said it's not good for man to be alone or make a helpmate and so forth and so on. And then he says, he says, Adam, he says, I want you to name all the animals. And when he said that, if you read the text, it seemed like God and Adam were like right side by side. So, so, so Adam, what do you call that? Yeah. That's a bird, right? Yeah. And what do you call that? Yeah. And what do you call that stuff in the water? And they're right there. But once he sinned, he hid from the one who desired to be close to him. You may be seated. When we hide our sins, when we hide our shortcomings, when we hide our vulnerabilities, when we try to not be exposed to God, we get distant from God. Amen? And, and, and that's interesting because God knows anyway. Secondly, um, not only, not only um, um, my fears um, of exposure make me distant, but my fear of disapproval make me defensive. One of the reasons that we have trouble having relationships and connecting with folks because we don't want to be disapproved of, and we get all defensive. We go from hiding to hurling. We go from exercising uh, one method of fear to another me method of fear. We start blaming things. We start pointing fingers. We start accusing. We, 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 we want to blame other folks um, for what's happening. Look at the text. Um, the, the more I fear disapproval, the more I point my finger at others. Look at this. Verse 13, verse 12. God asked, did you eat? What did I tell you not to eat? Adam answered, you gave me this woman and she gave me the fruit. The blame, he was just like a man. He blamed a woman. What kind of a man is that, right? But think about it. When we're insecure... When we feel vulnerable and people begin to challenge those things, they get close, we begin to point out other folks' fault. Well, look at you. Well, look at this woman. And not only did he blame the woman, but actually he blamed God. He literally blamed God because you gave me this woman. I was minding my own business. You said it wasn't good for me to be alone. You put me to sleep. I didn't have no say-so in who it was. I woke up a year. She was fired because I said, whoa, 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 man. You know, but, 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 but it's you. It's your, it's your fault. How many of y'all know folks that blame everybody else for their situation? As a matter of fact, I remember I was in Brooklyn. I was teaching at a college in Brooklyn. This was years ago. Gosh, this was a long time ago. And there was this group of, of, of men who I was working with, a group of about 28 men um, uh, that I was working with, and we would talk about all kinds of topics and, and things like that. And one time we talked about, you know, you know, being pure, you know, just like the dangers of, of just being just so wild in our own, our own sexual activity and, and really trying to understand um, what God would have us to do in that. And one guy gets up and says, you know, it ain't our fault that God made sex feel so good. He want to blame God for his own reckless behavior. 
Amen? Amen. And so we, we get defensive. And, and, and then, you know, the men, we're not by ourselves because look what Eve, how she responded in verse 13. Then Eve said, the snake tricked me into eating. Stop. He blames Eve. Eve blames the snake. And we're blaming, blaming, blaming. God wants us to own up for our, to our mess. Amen, amen, and amen. And you know, uh, Pastor Rick always talks about when you blame, you're being lame. Be lame when you blame. We don't want to be lame. We want to own up and face up to where we are short. The third thing that, that fear does is that we have not only um, fear um, that distances us from God and fear that makes us defensive, we also have fear of losing control that makes me demanding. Those who are afraid, those who are living in fear are always controlling. They are trying to control everything because they're afraid of being exposed. Come on, somebody. The result of sin, Adam and Eve lost control over their future. They got kicked out of paradise. They lost their advantage. The more out of control we feel, the more controlling we become. The more out of control we feel, the more controlling we become. I'm going to say that one more time. The more out of control we feel, the more controlling we become. We become bullies. We become demanding. We become demeaning. We become defensive. We become domineering. And the more insecure you are, the greater you need to get your way. Secure people don't need to have their way. Mm. So let me tell you something. I have my own insecurities. I have probably way too many to be leading anybody anywhere. But one place I am very secure in, and that's the spade table. Anybody here play spades? As a matter of fact, I, um, when I was at San Diego State, they were thinking about giving me a Ph.D. in spades because that's how good I was. And not only was I so good, they would give me a Ph.D. and then make me a tenured professor of the Department of Spadology. Mm. And, and, and so I'm, I'm very confident and I'm very comfortable at a spade table. So much so, I don't know anybody. Let me see you spade players. Now, if, you, if you're a good spade player, you know in different parts of the country they play with different rules. Sandbags, no sandbags, deuces wild, you know, all these different kind of rules. I don't even get it. I don't need to have my way. I sit at the table, you tell me the rules. <laughs> How y'all play down there? How y'all play up there? How y'all play over there? It don't matter because I'm confident and I don't need to be insecure about it. I, I can beat you with your cards. My cards are no cards. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Amen. And I'm ambidextrous, meaning I can win a book with my left hand or my right hand. It don't matter. <laughs> Let the church say whatever. <laughs> but do you understand what I'm saying? People who are secure, they don't need to control. But folks who are not, I, I can tell new spade players, they come to me, okay, we got this and this and the rules. I'm like, it don't matter. I'm going to beat you anyway with all your rules. Amen. Hey, 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 don't let the clergy collar fool you. I, I'll wear you out on the table. And so, so does, does that make sense? Look at verse 16. You will have a yearning for your husband, but the Lord, uh, but he will lord over you. He will, one verse says, he will dominate you. Listen, listen, listen. And some of you all are not going to like this, but I'm just going to tell you the truth. The original intent of, of God was that men and women, husband and wife, would be side by side. He did not put the man over the woman until what happened? Sin entered into the relationship. And in Christ Jesus, where sin no longer has dominion over us, we are restored back to the right relationship. We were not meant to dominate over each other. We were not meant to control each other. Uh, we were meant to be in relationship with each other. And that's where the battle of the sexes began. That's where misunderstanding came in. That's where confusion came in. That's where conflict came in because no one wants to be dominated. Even the Bible says we are not to lord over one another. We are to walk together as children of God side by side. Now, some of y'all will misinterpret this text and say, the man is over the woman, doggone it, I run my house, you ain't running nothing anyway. 
The only thing you're running is a dishwasher, the vacuum cleaner. Come on, somebody. You're running the microwave. And if she asks you, you're going to run the bath water. So let's keep it real. So what is the antidote to this fear? And I want you to know the antidote to this fear is God's love. 1 John 4, 18 says, wherever God's love is, there is no fear. Because God's perfect love cast out or drives out all fear. Love comes in the front door, fear goes out the back door. The opposite of fear is love. The opposite of love is fear. Fear is driven out by love. Why would a mother run into a burning building to save a child? Because fear goes out the way. Love drives her into the room. Come on, somebody. Does that make sense? Perfect love, or God's love, there is no fear. It drives out. And then in 1 John 4, 18, the second part, it says, it is the, um, the thought of punishment. It is the thought of punishment that makes a person fearful. Hmm. The negative consequences is what makes us afraid. We don't want people to see who we really are because we're afraid of the consequences. We're afraid of, to be ourselves in the presence of others. We're afraid to tell the truth to those who we love. We're afraid to share the fullness of who we are and what you think. One of the things that I say to my friends, and they know I am, um, I think I'm a, uh, a forgiving guy. I think that I'm a loving guy, I think. But I also try to tell the truth. And my friends don't need me to lie to them when they're messing up. My friends need to know that, hey, Mike, you blew it. You still my man. I love you. I'm going to walk with you. I'm not exposing you to destroy you, but I want you to know that you blew it. We need to be honest enough to speak to folks where they are so you can help them to be what God wants them to be. I'll talk a little bit more about that because y'all may not be able to handle too much more of this. How do I learn how to live in God's love? We have to make three daily choices. How do we know how to live in God's love? Because I just talked about all this fear. Don't you want to know how to live in God's love? How many of y'all want to know how to live in God's love? Let me tell you, the first thing we must do every single day, we must, there, there's, there's these three steps. The first step is we must remember. Remember, I'm sorry, we must surrender. Surrender our hearts to God. God is love. The closer we get to God, the more loving we will be with ourselves and with each other. The further I am from God, the more fearful I am. Watch this. The closer I am to God, the more loving I am. The further I am, the more fearful I am. Are you all with me on that? Adam and Eve, they were close to God. They were loving and caring. They hid and got away because of their fear. Fear drives us away from God. Are you all with me on that? But here's the thing. Job 11 gives us this beautiful picture. Listen to this. Verses uh, 13 through 18, it says, surrender your hearts to God. Stop. It says that we should surrender our heart to God. Watch this. And then turn to him in prayer. Watch. Surrender. Turn to him in prayer. And watch this. And give up your sins. Now watch this. Even though you do not, even though you do things in secret, then you won't be ashamed. You will be confident. Watch this. Fearless. Your troubles will go away like water beneath a bridge and your darkest night will be brighter than noon. Then you'll rest safely and securely, filled with hope and emptied of all worry. Listen to what it says. It says you do these three things, God promises to do eight things. How many of y'all would love to be unashamed and confident and fearless, and trouble will roll under, the, under you like, bridge, like water underneath the bridge? Your dark nights will be lit up by a bright moon. Then you will be safe. You'll be secure. You'll be filled with hope and empty, purged of all things that worry you. Amen. Every day we need to get up right where we are. And the first thing we need to say, God, take my heart. My heart has been hurt. My heart has been battered. I don't trust anymore. I don't, I don't love anymore. 
But God, take my heart. Can I say something that's very important? How many of you all have ever been hurt in your heart? Your heart has been hurt. Let me see. Your heart has been hurt. Let me see. Let me put my hands up. But watch this. And when we get hurt, it's natural for us to protect ourselves. And we say things like, never again. You will never hurt me again. You won't ever get that close to me again. I'm going to keep you distant. I'm not going to let God in. But the thing is, if you don't allow yourself to be open, not only will you not receive love, but you can't give it. And what I want you all to see, this is very important, is that it is a terrible life to go around living without receiving and giving love. But some of you all are saying, well, Reverend, you can talk all that trash you want to talk, but you don't know how hurt I've been. You don't know how many tears I've cried. You don't know how many times I tried it and I got hurt again and again, and it will never happen again. I, as a matter of fact, God, as a matter of fact, Pastor, uh, um, um, a broken bone heals and I don't feel the pain anymore. But what hurts my heart, I remember every day, and it hurts fresh each and every day. Even when I thought I was over it, something reminded me of it, and it hurt all over again. How many of y'all can relate to that? But let me tell you this. I'm going to tell you this from experience. When you let God back into your heart, God brings more than you think he brings to your heart. He not only brings his ability to love you, but he also brings his wisdom and his discernment. And that if you let God in, all of who God is comes in. And he, he gives you the ability to discern so you don't make the same mistakes you made before. And that you can receive love and more give love. I remember a couple I was dealing with and the husband... 32 years, they had been together, 32 years. They had actually been dating since, they have been friends since middle school, dated since eighth grade, and got married right after college, and, and they had been together. And they weren't even that old, but they had been together 32 years. And he cheated. And, and, and it's interesting because he got caught, and I'm going to tell you, you ladies are a trip. She caught him like months before and just documented everything. Why y'all do that? Let me tell you, just bust me out. Just, just tell us. It's, you, know, you ain't got to, you know. And, 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 and one of the things that they came to me because they wanted to work it out. We want to stay together. And the whole time in our first session, he was crying the whole time. And she said, see, he still feels guilty. That's why he's crying. And I was like, nah, I think those are different kind of tears. And, 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 and I said, man, tell me what those tears are. Those, that's not guilt. He said, that's fear. I said, fear of what? Fear that she'll never let me live, live it down. And she says, she says, I'm going to stay with him, but I don't know if I can ever trust him. I said, then you need to just leave. If you can never trust him, then you can never love him. You can't love that which you don't trust. I said, you're going to have to let God in your heart and let him in your heart again. If you can't let him in your heart, you guys might as well just leave. Go your separate ways. Save you some more pain. Every day, we must ask God to come into our hearts. Surrender our hearts to God. Surrender your heart to God. Amen? Two, remember. So the first is surrender. The second is remember the way God loves you. <laughs> My God, let me tell you how God loves you. First and, first and foremost, you need to understand that, that you are um, completely accepted. God loves us, and he completely accepts us. The deepest wounds may cause rejection by others, but God completely accepts you. We spend too much time in our lives trying to seek acceptance from other people when God has already accepted us. There are going to be some folks who will never accept you for what you have done, but it's okay because Titus 3 and 7 tells us that Jesus made us acceptable to God. In other words, that we are accept. Uh, he may not accept our behavior. He may not accept our attitude, but he accepts us. He may not accept the lying, but he accepts the liar. Hmm. 
How does God love us? He accepts us. I need you to stop for a moment. That's not good news. Because people remind you of all the stuff what makes you unacceptable. And God says, I'm not going to remind you of all the stuff that makes you unacceptable. You know that. I'm just going to accept you and love you for where you are. So y'all don't believe me, huh? Okay, let me, let, me, let, me, let me see if I can make it make sense to you because you don't recognize. It's interesting because I'm always overwhelmed by Matthew, I'm by Mark chapter 5. Uh, in Mark chapter 5, there's a woman with an issue of blood who is completely unacceptable on at least four levels, at least four levels. One, she had an issue with blood. Any blood issue in that time, mm. Two, they said that she was broke. Mm, that's unacceptable, right? Three, because she had a blood issue, watch this. Um, she, um, she couldn't have children. Unacceptable. And then the fact that she was sick and couldn't get any better um, made her unacceptable. And she was a woman <laughs> that made her unacceptable because they were already second-class citizens with all these issues. Now, how many of y'all want to try to hook your, hook your best friend up with that woman? I got a girl, she got a good personality, but she broke, she's sick, can't have children, right? Unacceptable. And yet, when she had an encounter with Jesus, he responded by calling her daughter. He invited her into the family of faith because of her faith in him. You ought to tell folks, no matter what your condition is, you are accepted by God. I thought somebody was going to get excited. Thank you, JB. I think that was JB. I don't know. Um, two, you are unconditionally loved. Lord have mercy. And God's love has two characteristics. It's consistent and it's unconditional. It doesn't go back and forth. It's not with, with, with um, conditions. Um, it's, not with, um, it's not inconsistent. You know, I, 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 um, I, I'm always interested in how people... Um, Say they love you, but they put conditions on it. Let me tell you something about love. Love, love, that's what it does. You can't help it. If I love you, I love you. No, no matter what your condition is, no matter what you have done, I may not be able to deal with you right now. I may not be able to look at you right now, but I still love you. Are you all with me on that? And we have to love others the way God loves us. And it says in 54, Isaiah 54, 10, it says, My love for you will never end. It says the love. We always get into trouble when we doubt the love of God. Amen. Because in the love of God, I am totally forgiven. Before God made you, he already knew what your worst activity would be, and he still loves you. Don't be surprised that God loves you in spite of yourself. It's interesting that, that um, I would always tell Donovan, um, you know, Donovan was the only one of the children that, that thought discipline um, would void him of love. Whenever we had to discipline him, or, you know, talk firm to him or give him a little something, something, you know, he would always pull himself together. He'd say, just disappear. You don't love me anymore. I'm like, fool, you know I love you. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Knock you out. Tell me I do love you. Amen. And, 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 and what happens is, in Romans 8 and 1, it says, uh, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Sin is wiped out. Um, we don't need to hold on to it. We need to release it that God has completely and thoroughly forgiven us. Amen. And listen to this. And not only that, that unconditional love is not only that I'm forgiven, but also I am considered extremely valuable. Right there. How much do you think you are worth? What makes something valuable? There are two factors that make someone valuable or something valuable. It depends on who owns it and how much someone would pay for it. Listen, listen, listen. I went to, in la this last summer, I went to an all-white party. I don't know what these all-white parties for. And I thought I had a white suit. Anybody been to an all-white party? And so my wife, I pulled out, she said, you ain't get your stuff. I said, baby, I got it together. I got this. She said, that's not white. I said, it is. She said, that's off-white. It's not an off-white party. It's a white party. So the day of the party, I'm running. See, y'all ladies like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I'm running out, and I go to um, Nordstrom's to try to get some white stuff. And in Nordstrom's, I found a nice, it was a T-shirt. And the T-shirt was 50% off. 
and it was $49. I looked at the tag, and it said 100% cotton. I was thinking that it was going to have, you know, white gold fibers in it or something. For, for $49, a T-shirt? It was white T-shirt. T-shirt. You could wash it. It said machine washable. I'm thinking for $49, it would have to wash itself. You know, it, it wasn't even wrinkle free. $49, and, I, and I'm sitting up here like, I'm in North Knox Center. I said, excuse me, ma'am, excuse me, excuse me. She said, you found everything? Like, no, I ain't found it. I'm looking for the $10 T-shirt rack. Where that's at? <laughs> and she says, she says, well, we, these are the only ones we have. I said, why is this thing? I said, it's a regular T-shirt. It's 100% cotton. It ain't got nothing in it. I said, why is this? A, she said, no, 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 no. She said, it's not the material that make it uh, expensive. She said, it's the designer, the one who made it, the owner. And I said, oh, value is connected to who owns it, who created it. Your value ain't what's in you. Come on. It's not what you're made of, but it's who made you. And so let me tell you what I ended up doing. I left Nordstrom's. I went to Walmart. And for $4.99, I got three T-shirts, 100% cotton. Now, they wasn't that thick, so I wore two of them and went to my white party. Come on, somebody. Then, just a free footnote, got to the white party and saw a bunch of folks in off-white. I was hot. I was mad. There was more off-white than white up in there. I, I'm just saying. But then, how much someone would pay for it? It's not only the value of who owns it. Because that person, that T-shirt that was just like the Walmart T-shirt, had Ralph Lauren on it, it was worth much more because of who owns it, who, 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 who's associated with it, who's connected with it. But also, the value is what people are willing to pay for it. Your house ain't worth anything unless someone is willing to pay for it. Amen. You can ascribe value for your house, but if no one's willing to pay for it, it ain't worth it. How much are you worth? That God would put his name on you, children of God, and then send his son to die for you. His only son. You are worth so much. Don't you ever let no one tell you that you're not valuable. God says you are because I gave everything I had for you. That you are extremely valuable. 1 Corinthians 7.23 says, you've been bought and paid for. By the death of Christ. Amen. Not only that, but every day, offer that same love to others. <laughs> you want to you wanna, you wanna build incredible relationships? One, you must surrender. Two, you must remember. And three, you must offer. Offer the same love to others. John 13 and 4 says, I'm giving you a new command. Love each other in the same way that I have loved you. Romans 15 and 7 says, Accept one another just as Christ accepted you. What does this mean? This means I must accept others like Jesus accepted me. I must love others like Jesus loved me. I must forgive others like Jesus has forgiven me, and I must value others like Jesus valued me. <laughs> Let me tell you all something. Exposing yourself, making yourself vulnerable, doesn't make you weak. It makes you human. Many of us run around here trying to be perfect. Guess what? Ain't nobody perfect. None of us. I don't care how beautiful you are. And I'm going to tell you, there's some beautiful people in here. I don't care how, how much money you make, you know, and there don't nobody make more money than Brother Marvin. I mean, he got so much money. His stress is, when, let me say, Marvin got so much money, he got to call the bank three days in advance before he, he writes a check. They got to they gotta, they gotta order some money for him. Amen. Amen. That's, 
That's, that's a lot of money, right? But it doesn't matter how much money you have, how much clout you have, you're not perfect. You are not perfect. And you don't have to be. But what you need to do is, is remember 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7, it says, love never stops being patient. Love never stops believing. Love never stops hoping. Love never gives up. That we must be patient with each other. That we must believe that God is working something out in others. And, and we must believe that, uh, that we have to hope the best for others. And we never, ever give up on other people. That doesn't mean you keep letting yourself get burned by someone. But that does mean that you keep praying for them. You keep hoping for them. And that, and that, that when you see their faults and when you see their shortcomings, you're not doing that to destroy them. You're not doing that to punish them. You're doing it so that they can be restored so God can use them. You know, some people are so afraid to make a mistake. There's some people that are so afraid to share their weaknesses and their, their shortcomings because we in the church have done a terrible job of restoring folks. We expose them and we destroy them because of our own fear. And I'm telling you here today, this place is not a place of exposing folks to destroy them. This is a place to expose folks to restore them. There was a guy in the Bible who was a cheat on his taxes. He, he, he cheated other folks on their taxes, charged them extra money, and Jesus had an encounter with him, and he was exposed. And Jesus didn't destroy him. Jesus used him. To make a difference. There was a woman at the well who had all kind of issues. And Jesus exposed her for who she was. And what he do? He used her. God wants to expose your insecurities, your sins, your shortcomings, not to tear you up. What kind of loving God would look to expose you, to destroy you, and to punish you? He exposes you so he can restore you. Let me share this and I'll close. My wife. I had to write a, um, and you can live with people for years and not know their secret insecurities, their secret sins. And I was in a class that was really difficult for me. Um, you know, I'm always trying to take classes to grow. And it was a class that made us really look deep within us. And it really brought some stuff out of me that I didn't, I didn't, I thought was gone or I didn't know was in me. And I had to write, um, write about that experience. And my wife proofreads all my papers. And even when we're in college, I always proofread my papers. And I didn't let her proofread. It was just too, I was, it was too vulnerable. And, and lo and behold, I was up typing and whatever. And uh, I went to bed. And, and I left it up on the screen. And I was half asleep. She said, do you want me to proof this? Half asleep. I'm like, yeah. What are you even thinking? And she read this paper. And then she got in the bed. She didn't say anything. The next morning, I'm up getting dressed. She said, I proofed your paper. And, and I said, what paper? She said, the one you left on the computer. I said, why did you proof it? She said, you told me to. I said, oh, I was so afraid. I went downstairs. And uh, I talked about in that paper my own insecurities, right? Um, and when I go downstairs, the computer is closed, and there's a sticky note on there. Don't worry. I know how to pray for you and support you. I said, that's a keeper. And she never, ever, ever mentioned that stuff again. She didn't hold it over my head. But Job said, like water under the bridge, no worry, safe and secure. God wants us to cast out fear so that we can have authentic relationships one with another. How many of y'all say that will bless you? You can't tell everybody your stuff. Let me say that one more time. You can't share your stuff with everybody. As a matter of fact, you'd be good to have one or maybe two people that you can share it with. Don't just put your stuff out there because people don't know how to handle the privilege of hearing your pain. You didn't get it. 
people don't always know how to, because they're so broken themselves. And so broken people want to break other folks or keep other folks broken and make them feel good. But what makes me feel good is that I can help you and I can encourage you to be all that God has called you to be. And I hope you do the same. Love others like Christ loved you. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for removing the fear that distance us, that makes us demanding and demeaning, and that gives us a desire to destroy others. God, help us not hide from you, but to be open to you. God, help us to realize that we are valuable beyond measure, and that our value comes from who owns us and what you are willing to pay for us. God, we are so grateful and honored that you would allow us to give our hearts to you even though they have been broken. But finally, oh God, I pray by the power of your spirit that you give me and you give us the power to love others like we've been loved by Christ. For we ask, oh God, that you save someone, that you restore someone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Was that helpful for anybody today? Now it says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. If you're not in Christ, that doesn't apply to you. But God says it can. And I extend an invitation for those who want to receive Christ, to be loved by him, completely and totally forgiven, to be valued by him. I invite you to come whose sins could be as far as the east is from the west. I invite you. Is there one this morning? Okay. Amen, amen, and amen. All right, y'all. Thank you for allowing me to share with you all for a few moments. Love never stops being patient. Love never stops believing. Love never stops hoping. Love never gives up. I pray that we never give up on you, that we believe in you, and we believe that God is going to do some amazing work in you. Amen? Amen. Amen. So now, Shannon, is there anything else we need to do before we? I'm going to invite you all um, to, you do one or two things. You can, or three things. You can go do whatever you plan on doing. You can come up to Santa Ana and, and see the, um, um, the fair, the health fair, the queues uh, stepped on campus today around 10. I had to leave unfortunately. But one of the things that I will ask if you would pray for, we had a bunch of cues on campus, so you know we got to spray for fleas and ticks. And um... <laughs> so, you know, we, we'll do that. And, and so, so the third option, yeah. So there's all kind of screenings. There's um, um, blood pressure. There's um, some other screenings on, um, I don't remember all the various screenings diabetes, um, there's some, some BMI, um, and so there's all kind of screenings up there, but there's also um, uh, self-defense um, lessons that have been up there, uh, lessons on how to eat healthier, actual food, uh, good food that you can taste, um, blood, uh, we're giving blood, we're registering for bone marrow, I mean, there's all kinds of things, there's a raffle, uh, for a couple bicycles that the, um, that the Q's gave. So they really, the Q's really stepped up, Alphas, Kappas, really, 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 really stepped up this year. And so we're excited about all that is happening. And it's going on until 2 o'clock. So you can do that. You can do whatever it is you're going to do. Or we can all go to Morton's and let, Martin, and let Marvin treat us because he got so much money um, for, di for dinner. And you're welcome, brother. <laughs> Uh, any time, any time. How many of y'all going to Morton's with Marvin? All right, cool. That's no problem. <laughs> Let us stand for the benediction. <laughs>